So hello everyone and welcome to Architecture in the Den with me, your host Lisa Rains. I'm uh, an architect, chartered architect with 23 years experience and I run the architectural, um, architectural practice franchise Pride Road. That's right, it is a franchise in architecture. If you want to know any more, please Google Pride Road, that's R-O-A-D franchise.co.uk um, and today I'm delighted that we're going to be talking to Roxanne Townsend about adding um, strings to your career bow. So um, hi Roxanne, hi. welcome to Architecture in the Den. Do you, um, do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah thank you. Um, so I'm Roxanne Townsend, um, go by Roxy most of the time. Um, I'm an architect at Stride to Clown, um, so I'm based in the Bristol office. I've got offices nationally across the UK, but I'm in Bristol, which is the head office, um, and I work in the schools team, so I do uh, lots of secondary school projects. How long have you been at uh, Strides for? Uh, I've been here for about four years now. So I did my part two here, uh, my part two placement, and then um, studied with my part three, did my case study and everything um, at Shride to Ground as well. And then I've just stayed on as an architect. So when did you qualify? Uh, I qualified just over a year ago now. So, yeah, still quite new. <laughs> <laughs> you scarred by the part three experience. <laughs> I really enjoyed it actually. I personally felt, uh, yeah, part three was my favorite bit because throughout the whole of uh, university, actually professional practice was my favorite module. So it was just basically a whole year of, of professional practice. So I loved it, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> so um, where did you do your, so where did you study? Uh, so I did my part one at Nottingham Trent University. Yeah. Um, and then I did my part two and three at UE in Bristol. So that's the University of? University of the West of England. Right, okay. Yeah. And um, what, uh, for our younger listeners, um, what A-levels did you do? Uh, so I did, oh, it feels like such a long time ago. Um, I did product design, um, geography, maths, and applied business studies. Oh, that's a really good combination. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, very good. And did you always want to be an architect? Uh, since I was about 12, yeah. <laughs> so <pretty> right <laughs> so that's that passion and drive so so once you decided at 12 you wanted to be an architect what what sort of things did you do I always just loved like going and seeing uh, different buildings and just bit, like paying attention to how things go together so um I think it's that kind of thing sort of stemmed from when I was really really tiny um and <laughs> one of the stories I always go back to is um because my, my dad was like renovating our house when I was really young like literally about four yeah. um and he was drilling a hole in a wall and I was so interested in wanting to see how, how it all worked and what he was doing I ended up getting brick, brick dust in my eye <laughs> because I was just so intrigued by it but yeah I've always just sort of been really interested in how things are built and how they go together and it's just sort of like progressing that sort of interest into go, going around looking at different buildings and things like that so was there a classic toy that you used to play with <laughs> I don't remember when I was very young in terms of toys but I know that I was absolutely obsessed with the sims because I used to all I wanted to do was design the houses and I didn't want to actually play the game just design, <laughs> just design the houses and leave them but yeah <laughs> I think that's a word to all those Minecrafters that are out there yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah. And so you progressed through school, did your A-levels, went to university. Why did you choose Nottingham Trent? Um, I chose it because when I went to the open day, the, um, the studios were really nice and the people there were like really, they just seemed really sort of supportive and mm -hmm. they kind of guided you through the open day and it's great. Because I think they had, they had this recognition that architecture is not really something as a subject that's really taught until university so they they kind of really helped to kind of outline what it was because I think they thought it was quite important uh, mm. to sort of explain what it was as a subject because it's quite, it's not quite understood I don't think unless you know an architect or you know you've got that experience of what an architect actually does it's it's quite difficult to kind of just take on a subject that you don't really know that much about 
Mm. So I think they did a really good job of uh, explaining that. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. You don't really know um, what it entails until you start the course, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, it is, it is a bit of a, because it brings together so many disciplines as well, doesn't it? So it's, it is a very sort of broad topic as a subject. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I think it's quite hard to explain this to kind of like careers advisors in schools about yeah. what, Architecture is, and um, and I think this is good. I, I I'm going to be doing a day in the life of, and so I think as part of the architecture in the den series, I think um, I'd like to see the podcast kind of appealing to sort of those at the beginning of their uh, or thinking about architecture as a career as well as kind of architects themselves. But that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we're here we're talking about adding strings to your career bow so yeah. um, it does link in really that does link in really nicely the, the day in the life thing with um one of the things that i do which is uh, being an, an ribo mentor mm. uh, as part of the student mentoring scheme um and that was one of the things that um because i when i went through i had three students this year um and went through with them at the on our sort of pre-session what what it was that they would like to know and one of one of those things was what is that what do you actually do as an architect like what 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 do you do as a, in a sort of day-to-day -day thing so I took them through kind of uh, a, a project sort of step by step in terms of what, what you what they actually did but also um kind of showed them a snippet of my calendar for the week just so yeah. they could kind of see get a bit of a flavor of, of what you do and I think they found it really interesting mm. so yeah I think that there's quite a disconnect. Um, there is quite a disconnect between architecture and kind of schools. I think that I think there needs to be, um, well, practicing architecture within architecture schools, and again, kind of schools um, sort of into sort of education, higher education, yeah. formal ed secondary school, and primary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you're doing the mentoring. Um, yeah. What else are you um, doing? Um, so I'm a land aid ambassador and I'm also a member of the FFT committee, um, which is a, it's a networking group for, um, it's aimed more towards young professionals in the construction industry, but there's not a specific age limit on it. Mm. Um, so yeah, those are two, two of the key things that I do. So, so how did you get involved in um, land aid? Uh, with Land Aid, to be honest, it was I went to um, an event. Uh, it was a Sibsi event, Sibsi Yan. Uh, so it's that was a. See. It's it's for a, a group for uh, chartered engineers. So it's more kind of engine engineering side, but they they do events that are kind of uh, bridge between architecture as well. So I went to one of those, and they had some speakers. It was uh, they had people there talking about their career and kind of difficulties they might have faced and how they've got through them and, and through, through adversity and things like that so it was a really good event but one of the people that was speaking there um, was Gavin um, from Land Aid and he he is um, on on the Land Aid board uh, for the West. What, what's his surname? I think it's Gavin Bridge from memory. Um, but yeah, so, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. I was trying to think of his surname, and I was like, I can't. I'm not 100 percent sure, but yeah, I think I think it's Gavin Bridge. Um, but yeah, he was he was there talking, and he mentioned Land Aid and the work they do because he was trying to get see if uh, more people like to get involved in the pro bono work and things like that. So um, at that point, that I thought it sounded really good, and I wanted to get involved in that. So um, I actually approached him at the end of that sort of panel discussion. Um, just to find out how um, how I might be able to get more involved and uh, he mentioned that there was a, a sort of uh, secondary kind of board as a sort of support to the main land aid um, which is the, the southwest ambassadors so uh, he put me in touch with the lead ambassador and then I got involved that way and it's been it's, it's been really great I've really enjoyed being involved in it since I I think I've been in it for nearly two years now so what do you do? What do you physically do? Um, so we we arrange uh, events to yeah. fund fundraise for Land Aid, and then also try to get involved in uh, volunteering at soup kitchens and things like that. Um, yeah, and obviously just be, being involved. So Land Aid in general organise events nationally. So they do different things like 
like different runs or walking they do like the land cape uh, land aid 10k which you can do it however you want you don't have to run you can do like all of those kind of events so it's just about being involved in them uh like we did in i can't remember what month it was now i think it might have been march did the land aid sleep out so i did a sponsored sleep out where i slept in my garden for the night so mm. yeah di different things like that it's quite varied in terms of what we do but... and, what, what, and what do land aid as a charity actually do so they are like an umbrella charity that um, they raise money to then basically uh, distribute to other charities that are helping like more on the ground. So they're a charity that charities can come to for funding for different projects that they're doing. But also um, Land Aid are also doing, so in, in the Bristol area itself, uh, they're, they're doing the project called E Street Muse, which is in Bedminster. So that's like a derelict um building that they're they're basically raising funds to convert that into how affordable housing for young homeless people so that they've got somewhere that's affordable to live mm -hmm. so it, it's a bit of a mixture but it's yeah a lot of it's to do with kind of helping other charities uh, to fund them and fund their projects basically for uh, people that uh, sorry charities that like help homeless people mainly young people though so if you were to give a piece of advice to someone who wanted to get involved in it, the, the, there's probably quite a lot of people listening who are kind of like nervous about putting themselves out there and networking you know you, you might be a young architect you work in a company and um you know you it can be quite all-encompassing can't it yeah um, and you kind of if you are kind of starting to think about career development um how should they start going about networking or getting out there so i had i had exactly the same thing when i when i first started networking and it's it's so normal to feel really nervous especially like entering into those scenarios and i think the one piece of advice i would say is um one try and find um a networking group or whatever it is a group that is uh, more aimed towards people in, in a junior level in their career because you'll find that everyone in that space will probably be feeling exactly the same as you they're probably not very experienced with networking which i personally found made it slightly easier it's still difficult i'm not gonna not gonna lie it was still very daunting going into the into that space but the other thing you can do as well is um you know for example with fft all of the committee members are on the web on the website so one thing that i would recommend is you know going and having a look on the the it doesn't have to be fft but any any networking group you're interested in find out who the committee members are and those are the people that you know i think everyone to be honest is would be happy to be approached but more even more so the people on the committee because they really want to be inclusive and involve people and we are very approachable and I, I, that's what I would recommend. And if you could, it, even if you're kind of nervous to, to sort of walk up to someone, you can always drop them a message on like LinkedIn or something beforehand and just saying, oh, I've seen your event of XYZ. I'm thinking of coming along. Would, would you mind introducing me to a few people? And that way, because it's likely that they'll know people because lots of people are kind of repeat attenders to these events, they'll be able to introduce you to different people as well. So that might make it a little bit easier to sort of break, down, break the ice that's in the initial really, instance yeah that's a really good idea just um making contact using social media to make contact beforehand and just yeah. the ice and just you've got someone there with you I'd, I'd also when you go to one of these events i'd i'd also i'd recommend just go go on your own don't go with a, a friend don't go with a friend because you if you're with a friend, you're more likely to just chat with them and not try and talk to anyone else. Yeah, yeah, that was something, yeah, I did, to be honest, when I started going to go into networking, I went on my own and it did, like you say, it does force you to, to make connections with people. And I think it is, it's nice to have someone there, but it, it, it kind of defeats the object a little bit, doesn't it, in some ways. So yeah, I would agree. So you've talked about land age, you've talked about mentoring, um, the RIBA student mentoring. Um, what was the FFT committee? So FFT, uh, for people that, that haven't heard of it before, basically um, is the junior kind of arm to FBE. 
So I know that's a lot of acronyms, so I'll, <laughs> I'll just go through what they are. It sounds a bit so, like duty. <laughs> literally, it does. Um, FBE is formed for the built environment. So it, it pretty much is what it says on the tin. It's a forum for people in the built environment. So any professionals in the built environment. And that is um, probably more aimed towards uh, people more progressed in their career. But there's absolutely, like I've been to lots of FBE events and they're, they're great and I've really enjoyed them. Um, so there is a range of people there, but FFT, which is formed for tomorrow, is the junior version of that. So it is more catered towards people just starting out in their careers. Um, so they're both networking um, forums and they're just aimed at slightly different um, people, basically, in, in the industry. But both you can attend, you know, there's not an age limit on FFT and it's not like you have to be a, at a certain point in your career to go to FBE events. But it, like I said, it's just... FFT personally, I found it easy, more accessible when I was first starting out in my in my sort of networking path. So mm. yeah, brilliant. So again, I think when you're networking, um, try to avoid events that just have architects there. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's exactly. very. I th I think I remember when I was kind of just in, um, you know newly qualified I think I just did architecture events and just thought well I'm not going to that <laughs> not there's no other architects there I'm like duh <laughs> no in hindsight you do want to meet people in other in other yeah. regions um I mean so for me in hindsight I've kind of I'm 23 23 years qualified and sort of looking back um sort of like on those early days of of, of networking what you the the contacts that you make back there some of those stay with you and as you get more senior they get more senior yes. so um you know they become decision makers and clients and referral partners um so it's about building relationships and you don't walk into a networking event expecting to win a client the next day um are there any sort of relationships that you're developing that's resulted in any work yet um there was a, so to be honest with you because i've been networking now for probably about three years mm -hmm. and last week was the first time i had a potential job opportunity come through my networking so that's obviously really exciting but Amazing. yeah i think yeah it is. I was really excited about it, but I think it, like you say, a lot of it is more about creating those relationships. And mm -hmm. uh, people have said to me, you know, when you're sort of starting, you're okay. Well, what's the point in going to networking? You're not even going to win any work. And it's just like, yeah, but you're, like you just said, it, you're kind of missing the point because those relationships, you know, if you start them sooner, if you would then end up in a situation where you know you're you're trying to get win a project. And it's you that you've, they've known you for five years or someone that's just walked in mm. then you're a, a great advantage so it's, it's all about investing that time isn't it in the kind of initial stages of your career i think it's so valuable and i think it's missed by quite a lot of people mm. absolutely yeah um yeah so i can't agree with you more um i mean it is it it's that duality duality i don't know if that's the right word kind of like you're dead nervous about putting yourself out there and yet once you kind of do start putting yourself out there you know it, it you're in for the long haul I think making yeah. relationships I mean that that's the nature of architecture isn't it it's a long-term business it's you know it's not a quick fit we're not going to design something tomorrow that that um kind of you know goes into production the next day you know sort of our I think architecture, you know, we're, we're trained to be resilient and persistent. Yeah. And I think if you look at yourself as, if you look at yourself as a building, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. your career development as a building, you know how long a building's take to come to fruition and all the red tape that you've got to get. You, know, you need to invest that time into yourself throughout your career yeah definitely mm. so yeah so what else what's next for you 
I don't really know, to be honest. I think I'm because I'm really enjoying the roles that I'm in. I'm kind of I'm quite conscious that I, what I do, I want to make sure I've got I make an impact there, so I'm not spreading myself too thinly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah I I really just you know I, I'm really because for the FFT we we uh, started a podcast as well uh, for, during the pandemic. So I'm really keen to like carry on the momentum with that. So yeah, I just want to carry on carry on doing what I'm doing. I think and just continue making those connections because I think it's really important. Um, and where do you see yourself in five years time? In five years? Oh, it's a really <laughs> hard question. <laughs> um, I don't know, I just, I think I really just want to be in a position where I, my network's gone from strength to strength and I really want to have raised my profile in the industry by that point. And I think that's one of my kind of key goals is to, to really keep developing that aspect of my yeah one of my strings i suppose is that is something i think is really key so yeah in five years time i'd hope to have to have a bit of a wider network and uh, more of an established profile i think brilliant uh, have you got any questions for me yeah i was actually going to ask you in terms of with like setting up the franchise and things like that how have you found that then links in in terms of uh, like networking and things like that is it do you, have you kind of had to build it up quite slowly or ha I wasn't sure how that worked. I found it really interesting as a, as a model. Yeah. Um, so in the, so um, the franchise, the architectural practice franchise, we, um, we really niche down and we just do um, domestic um, extensions. Um, but it's, it's a sector that's completely overlooked by most architects. Um, and kind of clients generally have quite a poor service from architects. So we're kind of trying to raise our, raise our, the, the game there. Um, so um, in order to join the franchise, you need to be an architect, a UK registered architect. So for me, I, you know, I am trying to network in architectural cir circles um to get to spread the word kind of nationally around the country and, and kind of like internationally as well at the moment actually because we're looking for um master franchisors in sort of other countries around the world um but yeah so for the franchise business predominantly i do um i do network in architectural fields um, but I'm sort of like you, you know, I'm, I'm constantly out there in networks, creating networks, getting out there. So for me, um, I, we've, I've just been running the Shiro's of Architecture, uh, conference. Um, so that is, it's kind of predominantly aimed at women in architecture internationally, um, and I just linked it basically through, so how that came about. So I know I'm going on quite a tangent. <laughs> That's really interesting, may I carry on? Um, so that came about through lockdown as well. So like you, you know, we've kind of gone into the whole podcasting thing and reaching out to different people like yourself, you know, I've got this podcast, would you like to be a guest, blah, blah, blah. And you know, through someone said, oh, why don't you have a chat with Sarah Colotta? So Sarah Colotta is a, she's a like architect um, by training and a digital transformation specialist. So dig digital marketeer. And we were having a chat and she said, oh, we need, we should run a, a conference. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just say yes to things. It's the best thing to do, isn't it? Just get involved. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's, uh, in fact, I said no to something yesterday and it kind of felt like it completely went against my grain. But yeah. It's about, re I think it's about recognising opportunities yeah. and saying yes. And a lot, you know, it's so easy to say no and kind of just keep in within your comfort zone. And I think, you know, every time, you know, you kind of give them, try not to miss opportunities say yes um yeah. in terms of your career pro progression um I did that answer your question 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. It's, that was really interesting to hear. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, is that, were there any specific uh, networking groups that you found particularly helpful in terms of... For me? Going to, yeah. Yeah, for me personally, I... Um, about 10 years ago, uh, when I was in a medium-sized practice, I kind of wanted to get into kind of business development and marketing. And I was told to um target women in property okay yeah um and um so that was like what by kind of one of my male directors um and i did i just <laughs> you know someone tells me to do something and i generally go and do it yeah it's, it seems like a good idea and it's kind of <laughs> an opportunity uh, yeah so i kind of went along and you know does anyone want to be part of the committee yes <laughs> yeah before i knew it i was chair <laughs> chair of the, of the northwest branch and and that's it you know it's just putting you know if someone's asking for volunteers you put your hand up if someone's yeah. asking you know are you interested in joining the committee you put your hand up you know if someone's saying you know we're looking is anyone interested in a senior role you put your hand up yeah without saying yes um yeah, so women and property, um, I became chair, that was really important for me. And then I stepped away from that um, when I, I, it kind of coincided with setting up my own company, Pride Road. Well, it was formerly known as Rains Architecture back then. Um, <clears throat> and then I was involved in the RIBA solo practitioners group up in the Northwest. And again, I ran, became kind of chair of that for a year or two. So that was really good. That gave me a seat on the MSA committee. That's the Manchester Society of Architects. And then from there, I was interested in the RIBA and kind of stood for council um for the national council so um i was a national councillor between 2015 to 2018 which was really interesting so kind of met a lot of the senior riba people Can i just ask sorry to interrupt you but what what kind of things do you do as an riba councillor what, what's that involve so at the time um I was on the, you kind of allocated to a committee or a group. So I was on the CPD committee. So involved in kind of uh, strategy. Um, you attend sort of the council meetings and it's basically, you know, kind of my, um, my kind of two um, sort of, intentions were around kind of small and micro practices yeah. and women in architecture so you know whenever th there was an issue that was raised that might um not be you know th th there's always a lot of talk about big business there and big companies and big architecture practices so you know i was always there go what about the small practice what about the small practice how's yeah. this for the small practice and you know sort of hopefully bringing in just an element of you know inclusivity and sort of kind of equal opportunities um so and then you you've got the opportunity to kind of bring forward a motion and one of my motions was about um, uh, challenging the RISBA stance on marketing because at the time they were marketing towards, uh, they'd focused their business, their marketing towards larger practices and larger clients. And I was like, well, actually, you know, the kind of consumer, the, um, the lay consumer, the homeowners is kind of being a bit neglected. Um, and so I kind of brought a motion forward and actually started, was kind of like the instigator of one of the RIBA's recent um, marketing campaigns uh, targeting sort of home, homeowners. Yeah. Um, just so, you know, the kind of small and solo practitioners have kind of got more represent, representation out there and more advocates. 
And actually that kind of takes me quite nicely into, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be standing for National Council again. Oh, wow, that's really exciting. So um, they've, there's a call out for candidates and um i'm gonna do that sticking my hand up thing <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but this time <coughs> instead of being one in uh going for a seat of one in six uh six places as part of the legacy of my term in council we actually voted for a, a smaller council so yeah. i've actually voted to make it harder for me to get back <laughs> and so there's only two national seats available okay so i'm going to be standing for one of those and again it's going to be on a on on a similar platform um you know support for micro and small practices yeah oh, well best of luck for that i'm sure i'm sure it'll go well um it's going to be a tall order because there's a load of you know there'll be a load of other candidates going for it so um i will just you know get the message out there and sort of push myself push sort of as hard as i can be resilient yeah. and, and see and see what happens um yeah but if you are listening please hopefully when i've stood for council please vote for me <laughs> when i've declared for sure yeah. <laughs> I might be coming to you for a nomination. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think that was um, that was really insightful. Um, and it's nice to it's not it is great to hear about journeys and it's sort of absolutely clear to see your passion and your drive and I wish you sort of all, all the luck and um, but you'll get there you make your own luck yeah thank you very much and yeah thank you for the opportunity to come on it's been really lovely to talk to you and what's um if you if you're going to be promoting your uh, FFT podcast how do we find you um so it's called FFT Western um, and you can find us on Anchor, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Okie dokie. Uh, yeah, if you want to give me a link to that, we can pop it in the uh, in, in the bio and the blog down below. So Great. Check out, check thank out you. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening to Architecture in the Den. Um, if you liked this, please press the like button, uh, subscribe, um, and I think it's, if you're on YouTube, click the bell for notifications. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is also available on as a podcast on Spotify. Um, and uh, also, if you want to see this podcast on YouTube and you're listening on Spotify, you can find us on YouTube. Um, if you are interested in joining us as a guest uh, please get in contact um, you can find me on social media as lisa rains r-a-y-n-e-s and don't forget to check out our website prideroadfranchise.co.uk so thank you very much for joining me i'm going to press the stop record button now